living things need food. Food provides energy and the raw materials an organism needs to grow and to maintain itself. Most animals must break down their food before their bodies can absorb it. Their food must undergo digestion. The food this nematode eats requires little breakdown. The nematode's digestive system is a fairly simple tube. But other living things are far more complex. When we are very young, all we need to grow and to maintain ourselves is milk. As we grow older and our bodies develop, we need more solid foods. The foods that comprise our diets must be mechanically and chemically broken down into small, simple molecules. Our bodies need a balanced diet, which includes varying amounts of each of the basic nutrients. Proteins, fats, carbohydrates. We need other things too, such as fiber, vitamins, minerals, and water. Most foods are combinations of different nutritional components. The digestive system can efficiently absorb all kinds of nutrients. Though the digestive system looks complicated and tangled, its basic structure is fairly simple. If we could straighten it out, we would see that the digestive tract is really just a long tube with specialized sections. Digestion begins in the oral cavity, the mouth area, then move down the esophagus to pass into the stomach, which is an enlarged and specialized part of the tube. From there, it moves into the small intestine, and from there into the large intestine, or colon. There, the process is completed. The nutrients have been absorbed, and the remaining material is expelled. The tube is about seven meters long in a living adult made of layers of strong muscles and other tissue. Along the tract, there are several accessory organs essential to digestion, even though food never actually passes through them. They are the salivary glands, the pancreas, the liver, plus the gallbladder, and glandular tissue that lines the stomach and small intestine. In the body, the tube is folded over itself many times. There is the oral cavity, the esophagus, the stomach, the small intestine, the large intestine, the salivary glands, the pancreas, the liver, plus the gallbladder and glandular tissue that line the stomach and small intestine blood vessels, and nerves run throughout the system, helping to regulate and control the organs. X-ray motion pictures show that digestion begins with the strong chewing and grinding actions in the oral cavity. Chewing increases the surface area of the food. If we ingest food and don't chew it properly, little of the digestive fluids can mix with it. If we break up the food, more surfaces are exposed to the digestive fluids, speeding digestion. Increasing surface area is important throughout the digestive process. Chemical digestion performed by digestive juices also begins in the oral cavity. Saliva is a fluid secreted by three pairs of salivary glands when food enters the oral cavity, or even when we are just hungry. It contains an enzyme called tyalin that converts starchy carbohydrates into simpler sugars. When we swallow, the tongue pushes the food back into the throat or pharynx. The pharynx leads to two passages, one to the stomach and the other to the lungs. When we swallow, a valve momentarily closes the opening to the lungs so that food must go to the esophagus. Occasionally, if we talk or laugh while eating, food does go down the wrong passage, blocking the flow of air to the lungs. If the passage is not cleared through coughing or other means, we choke. 
Food passes from the oral cavity to the stomach through the esophagus, pushed quickly along by wave-like contractions of muscle. This kind of muscular action is called peristalsis. The food passes through another valve to enter the stomach, where it is stored temporarily. As we eat, the stomach stretches to accommodate the incoming food. The stomach lining holds millions of glands that secrete gastric juice, another kind of digestive fluid. When we eat, or even just think about food, the glands of the stomach begin to produce gastric juice. They secrete an inactive substance called pepsinogen and hydrochloric acid. The substances mix with the food in the stomach. Hydrochloric acid breaks food down, kills some bacteria that might harm us, and turns the pepsinogen into an active digestive enzyme, pepsin. If we place a strip of beef into gastric juice and watch it for about one hour, we can see the effect pepsin has on protein. But the stomach is protein too. Why doesn't pepsin digest it? Sometimes it does, and a painful ulcer forms. Here is a highly magnified picture of a stomach lining in good condition. An ulcerated stomach is painfully injured by the action of its own digestive juices. Normally, the stomach is protected by a coating of mucus secreted by the stomach. Ulcers are the result of a breakdown of this protective mucus and are often related to psychological stress. The stomach churns and mixes its contents thoroughly through muscle contractions. The actions of the stomach are regulated by hormones and nerves. Food entering the stomach stimulates nerve impulses that travel to the central nervous system, which in turn sends impulses to the gastric glands. The glands secrete more gastric juice. Another control mechanism is hormonal. Hormones are chemicals that travel in the blood. They activate specific organs to perform needed functions. In the lower area of the stomach, some foods, particularly the digestion products of protein, stimulate cells in the stomach lining to release the hormone gastrin. The hormone travels in the blood to the gastric glands, stimulating them to produce more gastric juice. This hormonal mechanism regulates itself because the stomach lining can sense the level of gastric juice. When the level is correct, the stomach reduces its flow of hormone. The gastric glands are no longer stimulated and their production slows. The soupy mixture of food and gastric juice is called chyme. Stomach muscles force the chyme through a valve into the small intestine. The small intestine performs the major process of digestion. The acidic chyme enters the small intestine, indirectly stimulating the pancreas to produce digestive juices. Pancreatic juice is alkaline, opposite to acidic, and it protects the intestine by neutralizing the stomach acid. Pancreatic juice contains several enzymes that carry on digestion. The enzyme trypsin works on proteins. Amylase works on carbohydrates. And lipase works on fats. But fat is hard to break down. An enzyme alone is not enough. Another substance called bile is essential to the digestion of fats. Bile is formed in the liver continuously and is stored until needed 
in a sack-like reservoir called the gallbladder. Fat and water do not mix. We need something that will increase the surface area of the fat, break it up into smaller bits. That something is bile. If we add bile to the fat and water and shake them, we see that the fat breaks into tiny droplets. More surfaces are exposed to the enzyme lipase. The flow of bile is regulated hormonally also. First, food entering the small intestine stimulates the gallbladder to contract. Certain parts of the bile are then reabsorbed through the intestinal wall and carried by the blood back to the liver. The liver responds by increasing its production of bile. The gallbladder is only a reservoir and is not essential to our health. It can be surgically removed if necessary, as when severe gallstones block its ducts. Regardless of the gallbladder, the production of bile slows again when the last of the food leaves the first part of the small intestine. The muscles of the small intestine move the food and digestive juices back and forth, mixing them through an action called segmentation. Peristaltic waves move material along like this. Segmentation mixes it this way. As these highly magnified pictures show, the inside of the small intestine is not smooth. Its surface area is increased by millions of tiny projections called villi. A microscopic section of a single villus shows that it is covered by thousands of column-like microvilli. The molecules of nutrients are absorbed through the microvilli. The villi and microvilli increase the surface area of the small intestine enormously. Through each villus runs a network of blood and lymph vessels. Certain minerals, vitamins, and water pass directly into the blood and lymph. The products of protein digestion, called amino acids, pass into the blood. As do carbohydrates, now in the form of simple sugars. Fat is absorbed differently. As the fat molecules pass through the absorbing layer, they combine into larger molecules. They bypass the blood capillaries and enter the lymph system. From there, they enter the general circulation of the body. The blood capillaries into which the other nutrients passed combine to form veins. And these, in turn, join to form the larger portal vein which leads to the liver. Thus, the nutrients and other absorbed material, such as the digestive juices, flow in the blood to the liver. The liver stores the nutrients, changes some of them, and releases them back into the general circulation, ready for use by the body. When the material leaves the small intestine through a valve and enters the large intestine, 90% of the usable foodstuffs have been absorbed. At the very beginning of the large intestine, there is a small, apparently useless, dead-end passage called the appendix. Sometimes this passage becomes blocked, leading to a swelling and infection of the area called appendicitis. Often the infected appendix must be surgically removed. Otherwise, it may burst with extremely serious consequences. Normally, however, the unabsorbed material and much water pass without problem into the large intestine, or colon. The only secretion of the colon is the lubricating mucus. No digestive juice is produced there. However, bacteria, many that live permanently in the colon, continue to work on the food to a small degree. Most of the remaining water is absorbed.
the material gradually changes into a semi-solid form. Peristaltic waves slowly carry the material into the lower region of the colon and the material is eliminated from the body. Virtually nothing usable remains. Our digestive systems are complex, reflecting the complex needs of the body. By treating the digestive system properly when we eat, we serve the entire body. We should eat in relaxing circumstances. Nervousness can inhibit the digestive process. We should eat slowly, because the stomach is slow to sense that it is full. We can overstuff ourselves by eating too quickly. Meeting the needs of the body is good, but surpassing them can lead to obesity because the digestive system is so efficient at what it does. Our bodies are capable of an amazing variety of actions. To perform those actions, we need food. Our digestive systems break food down to provide our bodies with the energy and raw materials we need to grow and to maintain ourselves.